you started to think about Aha, uh -huh. okay. Um, um, anyway, so I'll tell you about some of this research as we go along. Of course, this no was not done uh, by myself. There's a number of collaborators involved in the work I'm going to be talking about. And of course, we have uh, some funding from uh, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Um, so I think I actually put too much in this talk, so I may not be able to get through all of this. But I'd like to, of course, just talk a little bit about phase field versus phase field crystal modeling. I guess Louisa said you've talked about this method but I thought I'd just give a little bit of an overview of it before I got down to the, the sort of newer stuff. Um, um, and then I'd like to talk about applying it to these two dimensional materials that both form hexagonal lattices, but there's some sublattice ordering in the case of uh, HBN. And then, um, so these two dimensional materials uh, models, um, the original ones we played with didn't have any out of plane deformations. And so, you know, when you have dislocations and there's stress fields, it can it can buckle to get rid of some of this energy. And so clearly that's an important physics, particularly with dislocations in two dimensions. So I'd like to talk a little bit, kind of a trivial extension, really, uh, computationally not so trivial, but uh, analytically. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, bilayers, if I get that far. Uh, for example, uh, when you have graphene and HBN layers and you put them on top of each other and you rotate them, they form these moray patterns and, and all sorts of interesting structures appear. Um, and oh, I guess that was the last part. Okay, so I guess this part is more on, on how you actually map these onto or parameterize them in, from uh, density functional calculations. Okay, so uh, phase field models typically uh, most often is thought of as you're modeling uniform fields, fields that in equilibrium are constant typically. Whereas uh, in phase field crystal type modeling, uh, the idea is to look at uh, fields that are periodic. And the reason why it's nice to do that is you all, you automatically have elasticity. If it selects a periodic structure as the lowest energy state, if you squeeze it, shear it, whatever you do, the, the energy goes up. And so you automatically build an elastic response without having to introduce displacement fields and stress fields and strain fields. You just get it automatically. So it's so it's kind of nice in that way, although there are some advantages and disadvantages. Um, but uh, so with a typical phase field modeling, the physics that you get out of these models can be seen by taking what's called the sharp interface limit. So I'm just giving an example for a liquid solid transition where you may have one field, the so-called phase field, that's distinguishing between a liquid and solid state. So maybe uh, at least historically people have said, you know, liquid zero, solid is one. And then you may have other fields. So oftentimes the two states may have a different concentration, a different density some quantity that's conserved, and that really restricts the growth of, of things and, and, and motion. And so, uh, and we assume that we have dissipated dynamics, that the rate of change of these fields is determined by gradients in the free energy. So you're typically set up to, to take the slope to the minimum energy state. You have to be a little more careful with conserved fields so that you don't, uh, so that you conserve that quantity. And this is originally, I guess, Kahn years ago, essentially said that that this is uh, proportional to the gradient of a flux, and the flux is proportional to a gradient in the chemical potential. It's this quantity, if this was a number density, would be the chemical potential. So really, it's, it's driven by gradients in the chemical potential, the, the dynamics. So if you take the so-called long wavelength limit, and that's if we look at perturbations in a front, and we assume this length scale is much, much larger than the width of the interface. There's always some width to the going from one phase to the other. And so you can, if you go out into a bulk region, Oh, you can just linearize there. It's actually very easy. You just get a diffusion equation. And so that makes sense. Concentration or density, they diffuse. You, um, you consider the motion of the interface because there's a conserved quantity involved. Uh, the velocity is proportional to the flux. You need to have a flow of particles into the interface or out of the interface in order for this to move. So this is really just saying that the gradients, this is really the flux into the interface. And finally, there are some boundary conditions. And so typically, the concentration at the front will depend on whether it's curved and whether it's moving. So there's uh, the gibbs thompson effect, so there's a curvature effect, and there's this um, uh, uh, velocity effect. And you can derive analytically all the parameters that go into these so-called sharp interface equations uh, analytically depending on the, the form of the free energy functional. And so I just, this isn't very useful, but just to show that all parameters that go into this free energy, you can equate exactly to the parameters that go into these sharp interface models, which were introduced you know, many, many years ago by uh, Gibbs and other people. So if you ask the question, what happens if we take the same limit for a phase field crystal model, what do you get? Well, the simplest thing to do is to consider um, 
the density to be some sort of smoothed average density. And then you have, so this would be the uh, principal reciprocal lattice vectors that would uh, give you a, a given crystal structure. So this term will produce your periodic structure. And so now the amplitude of this, if it goes to zero, we're in a liquid. If it's a finite value, we're in a solid state. So if we're going from a liquid, this phi would go to zero to some finite value. And the density, so typically liquids and solids in coexistence will have a different density. And so um, in the simplest case, you can say that um, I have a solid, there's takes on certain values in the solid, certain the liquid, and then you can um, calculate the long wavelength limit. And you can get exactly what we got before. So it all comes out exactly the same. If that's all you got, it wouldn't be worth doing, of course. Um, you get extra physics. And you automatically get anisotropy, of course, because now we have some crystal structure. And so if you look at uh, the energy of, of an interface, it'll depend on the orientation. And so years ago, there's some analytic calculations for just a 2D triangular case. And then you can use it to study shape transitions. And so there's uh, a number of people who have done calculations to look at how the shape of crystal when they're growing depends on the flux, the temperature, temperature and various, various quantities like that, um, and so forth. Um, but you also get uh, elasticity coming in. And so as I mentioned before, and Louisa did, if you, instead of saying this is just a constant, these, these amplitudes, you assume that there is some distortion. And so this U would be the displacement field that would enter continuum elasticity theory. It's exactly the same thing. So you can take this and you can stuff it into the free energy and then calculate what the energy is. And you'll get exactly what you expect. So you find that the elastic energy is you know, a sum over the stress times the strain. And the coefficients, um, these, these uh, quantities, you can calculate exactly. It gets a little more complicated depending on how many modes you need to include in this in the summation to get the structure you want. But you can analytically drive all the elastic constants. Um, another thing that you might consider is, well, what happens to a dislocation? We know if you shear a dislocation, it'll move, or if you squeeze it, it can move. And so, well, Louisa and, and her collaborators wrote this very beautiful paper, quite difficult calculations, and we're able to show analytically that the velocity is proportional to the, to the uh, stress tensor, the so-called uh, pH Kohler force. So this was a really nice calculation. Um, and just to show that this is what we expect to get. So this model, in addition to all those sharp interface equations, has elasticity, has a pH Kohler force acting on, on dislocations. And you can extend this to what happens if it's a... If, there's another field like concentration, then you get some solute drag, um, and they recently extended this to 3D in a very nice paper. Um, so you can extend these calculations to higher dimensions. So in the end, traditional phase field models give you this. This phase field crystal model gives you all this physics, but it also gives you all this physics. Um, and so um, you still lose something, unfortunately. There's still a, a computational cost because now you simulate these models and your mesh size is limited by the size of an atom. So your grid is maybe the 10th of an atom or something like that. So it's, it's, it's very small. And so compared to phase field modeling where your uh, DX is just limited by the width of the interface. So there's a difference between the two. Although often those two quantities are not that different. Um, but of course, as Louise was mentioning, the reason you do this and uh, not do MD, because of course, molecular dynamic simulations, you have all that same physics that I just mentioned. Um, but the problem with MD is, of course, your, your time step is limited by the uh, lattice vibrations. And so those are picoseconds. Your time, sex, time steps are like femtoseconds, something like that. In these particular models, your time step is limited by the vacancy diffusion rate. And so vacancy diffusion rates can vary enormously from seconds to nanoseconds. Um, but typically, in, in many cases, um, that your time step is going to be like a million times bigger than you do in MD. It can be 10 million. In some cases, they can be actually quite similar, quite close, depending on the diffusion constant in that system. But so that, that is the advantage of using this kind of approach. Okay, so I said, uh, and if there's any questions anytime, just uh, don't hesitate to, to interrupt. I, I don't mind. So I'd like to talk uh, about modeling Here's a free energy functional, probably the simplest that you could write down that will produce a periodic structure. And this cubic term breaks the up-down symmetry. If you don't have this term, basically you're gonna get stripes and the wavelength of the stripes is determined by this, right? So if, if the N, the density, so this is like an, a number density, if it was like A cos QX, then this would just become one minus Q squared. So you'd minimize the free energy with Q is equal to one. 
But this term here, it breaks the up-down symmetry. So it breaks the stripes into dots, essentially. And the dots will form a triangular pattern if you put a minus sign there and a honeycomb pattern if you put a plus sign. So this is, we can say, is here's our model of graphene. And you can barely see that the maxima, there are maxima that form a honeycomb structure. Um, they're very hard to see. That's why I, I drew it there. Um, another way of modeling this is instead of modeling the density, this periodically varying thing, you model these amplitudes, these complex amplitudes. And this is uh, what Nigel Goldenfeld and collaborators at UIUC did uh, quite some time ago now. Uh, I can't remember the exact dates. The advantage of this, at least if there's not too many distortions in the system, the amplitudes are almost constant. So now your DX can be much, much larger. So you can go to drastically bigger systems. And we've done simulations that have had like 10, equivalent to about 10 to 100 billion particles in them um, when you go to this type of system, although it does depend on the structures you're looking at. Um, you can also, you can tell these things, um, some of the, the properties of these ones are hard to control. For example, you can't get the right Poisson ratio if you use these, but you can come up with more complicated models um, that uh, have some advantage that you're able to tune, parameterize them better with experiment. And this is a model came up with a collaborator, uh, Sumiso Mokanta, um, uh, that can produce these uh, kind of nicer looking patterns, but also a bit more flexible. Another way of doing it, so this is this method is just adding more length scales, but there's a very nice paper um, by this group at McGill who um, essentially took this free energy, but they added on three-point correlations. And so this model essentially just has two-point correlations. So all it does is selects length scales. But if you have three points, then you have an angle. And so you can set up this three-point correlation to say, I want you know, 120 degree bond angles, or I can do it square, or if you choose something irrational, you get a quasi-crystal. So it's a very powerful method, but computationally, it's actually much more expensive to use. But, um, so we wanted to take a look at these things to study things like grain boundary energy. So this is one of the, the physical systems we wanted to look at, where we start out with a system where we, we rotate it, some angle. This is rotated, uh, this is a symmetric, so we rotate them like this, we put a liquid between them, we let it solidify, and then it'll form some grain boundary. And you can see that there are these dislocations, these, uh, these cells that don't have six neighbors. And so this is just taking the peaks and putting a dot at them all and connecting them up. So these are the, the classic five, seven stone walls defects that are seen experimentally. Um, but the problem is, uh, so we did these calculations and we said, great, we can calculate grain boundary energies as a function of this misorientation. And then we can compare it with what other people have calculated to see. And we did that and it was a mess. So um, these, uh, the black dots are the, these PFC, I think it was PFC three, well, uh, one of those models. And we looked at all these different papers, all the calculations that had been done up to this date, and they're kind of all over the map. And so we had parameterized this model by fixing the Young's modulus to agree with graphene, which is about a terapascal, something like that. But it was kind of a mess. And we started looking at these papers and we realized that, does anyone know these authors? Um, a lot of it was essentially junk because the problem is on these grain boundaries, essentially at least the small angle ones in particular, maybe not so much the large angle, they're essentially just lines of dislocations. And the elastic fields decay very slowly, like one over R in two dimensions. So if you have a small system, you miss most of the energy and you're doing DFT calculations, you can't use a huge system. So we basically just had to start doing all the DFT calculations ourselves. So what we did is uh, we did our own DFT calculations. Uh, we did use the face field crystal model to, as an initial condition, so we wouldn't have to relax so much with the, with the DFT calculations. But those ones, the smaller the angle, to fit it in a periodic box, your box gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the smaller the angle, the more expensive calculations become. The smallest angle we could realistically get to was around four degrees with the DFT calculations. And then we simply parameterized all our other models to match exactly at that one point. So that's how we parameterized it. And um, in comparing with, so there's two types of potentials people use in MD. I think most people think this Aerobo is better than this Teresoff. Um, but the, the Young's modulus were more or less in agreement, but only one of them really gets the right Poisson ratio, which is, which is related to the uh, shear modulus. But just to give you an idea of how close you get. 
So these are the results. So now this is the grain boundary energy as a function of the misorientation in the system. And so here are the two molecular dynamics simulation, which were done at one Kelvin. That's this one, and that's this one. So it's hard to compare to say, you know, which one do we believe? Um, this, oh, sorry, this is the, the Arabo. These are DFT calculations, and these are these different models. It seems the PFC3 sort of agrees the best. The small angle stuff works reasonably well, but that's the kind of deviation you get between these models. And a bit of the problem is all these calculations are at zero temperature or one degree. Um, and so we don't actually expect to get exact agreement between the two, but that's the kind of result that you get. And you typically get sort of the right features where they... Uh, and these are kind of determined by geometries. And so we use these models to calculate grain boundary energies and polycrystalline structures. We applied it to strained uh, uh, pa uh, the patterns that appear when you strain graphene layers, uh, triple junction energies, which turns out triple junctions can have negative energy, which is very odd, um, but well, I won't get into that today. And you can also use them just to create initial conditions for MD and DFT calculations, which we did to, to calculate thermal conductivity in graphene, um, and other people have used it to calculate mechanical uh, uh, properties. So the other thing I wanted to talk about is modeling hexagonal boron nitride, which has the same crystal symmetry, but it has this sublattice ordering. And the thing that makes this quite interesting um, is that you can now have inversion boundaries, which you can't have in graphene. So in this particular case, um, so this line of blue turns to red, and so you get this inversion boundary. This boundary would never form experimentally uh, because it's really high energy. What you get instead, as I'll show later, is, is dislocations. So there's various methods of doing this, just like the graphene. One of them is you choose a density to produce the hexagonal structure, and then you introduce a concentration that will produce this ordering within this structure. Um, you can also simply take, I'll write down a free energy of the N's, the B's, and then put coupling between them so they want to sit next to each other or, or whatever you want to do. Or you can combine this method with adding three-point correlations, and when you do that, uh, this is a really nice paper. They can get perovskites, these really complicated structures uh, using this kind of approach, but it's kind of expensive. So we're going to focus on, on this middle one, um, which works reasonably well for, for this hexagonal boron nitride. And so then we can start calculating the energy of these aversion boundaries. The lowest one is uh, when you get these sort of four, eight dislocations. The next one is the line of uh, cells that have eight atoms in them for four I'll show a bigger picture of that in a second. We can also start looking at, again, the grain boundary energy. This one isn't symmetric because of the, the, um, because of the underlying sublattice. Um, you can start looking at uh, dynamics. So if this is uh, an inversion boundary from here to here, you'll create uh, um, um, inversion boundaries and this thing will shrink. So this was started as a circle, but as it starts to shrink, it forms this triangular structure with these kind of odd looking uh, are, there's like 12 atoms in the corner of these things, all attached by four eights. So all of these structures that we predicted uh, have been seen experimentally in different systems. And so I'm just going to flash through a few of these. So in HBN, these four eights uh, you often see, and the energies that we calculated, uh, I won't get, I'll get into this a little bit later, but are reasonably close to the, uh, the only other measurement that we found in this system. So we can predict these four eights. So those are the lowest energy ones. But if you go to other complicated systems, uh, like MOS2, uh, experimentally, sometimes you find these 8-8 ones, so they've also see, been seen experimentally. These 4-4s four have been seen experimentally, and even, I don't even know what this notation is, I did know at one point, Z6i, but they also appear experimentally. So all these predictions are, have been uh, seen in experiment. And of course, if you look at not in, just an inversion boundary, but one of these um, grain boundaries where you've just rotated, Sometimes you get five, seven pairs, which you also see experimentally. If it's a low angle, you'll get uh, a bunch of sometimes funny looking uh, dislocations. Um, this is also, this is an experiment that looked at um, this case that I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. And they do also get, they call this a heart shaped defect. So it sort of kind of looks like a heart. Um, so we get exactly the same patterns. These heart shaped defects are connected by lines of four eights. And so we get exactly uh, the same thing that they get. And also for the, uh, kind of skip myself there, the low angle boundaries, sometimes you get weird collections of, of boundaries that also have been seen experimentally. 
So all these kind of defect structures that we've uh, predicted seem to be seen experimentally. Okay, so that was just working with purely two-dimensional sheets. Mentioned. Um, in some cases, we're very worried about the fact that they're not flexible, that they can't buckle to release strain. Um, and so we thought we'd do the simplest possible thing we could, um, is simply introduce um, another field, so a height of the sheet, and then we simply make a variable change from xc to x, y, and h, and uh, change our variables, and we end up with, with an expression like this, where all the Laplacians have changed to include gradients in the height, um, and we also by hand added in a bending energy term. So this was just we stuck it in by hand. So the question is, well, of course, is this model, what right does it reduce to the proper? Th so the first thing you can do is simply say, well, let's assume, um, let's do a small deformation limit. Like, like I mentioned before, let's calculate the elastic energy. And when you do that, when you have this extra field, you end up with uh, actually this, exactly the same elastic energy with this extra term, except your um, stress fields have this extra term. Um, and this is exactly the free energy that was used uh, in the, the study flexible sheets in graphene. So when we have no dislocations, we can just move deformations, we get exactly what other people have used in, in the field to study these systems. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted to look at was if we have a dislocation. So if we have a dislocation in the system, calculate its energy, uh, this is going to cause stress in the, in the system, and then the H is deformed to release. So here's a plot of stresses um, for a perfectly rigid layer. These are the continuum uh, approximations, which in the, uh, if you location core, basically exactly. Um, there's a rather dramatic decrease Increase how it to buckle to relieve some of the strain system, and if you measure the um, the energy, so in fact, because we have a periodic system, I always have a pair of dislocations. So this is the energy of a pair of dislocations as a function of the lawn of the system size. And what you'll notice is it's perfectly rigid, and you can actually calculate this analytically. It goes to infinity if you let it. These things if they start to saturate, and. It, these lines, these red and blue lines, they correspond to a fit like this. I have no theory for this, just numerically that seemed to fit the data the best. And so, of course, if I now let L go to infinity, I have prediction, I just divide this number by two, and so we can predict what the energy is of a 5-7 dislocation in graphene, and we get 6.8 EV, which seems to be relatively consistent. But my main point is, in this particular case, the difference between rigid and flexible is quantitative. They're, they are, or, uh, oops. That should be, you know, I flipped this. That should be qualitative difference. So there, it's not just quantitative. One goes to infinity and one's finite. So this is really a major difference between the two. Um, we can do the same thing with trees. So this is the energy of those particular uh, inversion boundaries. This is for flexible. So in this case, these boundaries, they really don't create long range elastic fields. And so they do stress close to the, the boundary. And so you can lower the energy, I think somewhere between eight and 20%. So it's, it's, significant, but it doesn't make a qualitative change. And so I, I switched the words qualitative and quantitative in the song. And, and the energies we get are uh, fairly well. So one of the things we can now start studying, um, and you know, as I say, how am I doing on time? I should, probably might skip this section. So it uh, it ends at quarter two, is that? Okay, so maybe I'll skip this if anyone's interested in, in, in the study of these flexible sheets. So then we can start looking. We add thermal fluctuations. You know, I put my phone on my laptop and it blinked and now it's, it's not this. Wow. It's going in. Okay. Good. Brand new laptop. So I'm a little, that I run Linux on, so things don't always anyway if anyone's interested in there's there's a lot of theories for how these the fluctuations uh, in the height of the sheet uh, depend on temperature and, and and various quantities and so i i think i i might skip some of these calculations 
Um, I'll only say that the simulations that we did are quite consistent with these predictions. They work out quite well, despite the fact that we really don't have great statistics. It does fail in one thing. When you look at the, the probability distribution of the velocities of the height, ours fit really well to Gaussians. But an experiment was done, I think, in 2016, or no, more recently than that, quite recently, and they clearly don't get Gaussian. So there's something that's missing in, in our calculations. And I think it's our dynamics. We have this uh, dissipative dynamics, Whereas, of course, in MD or, or experiments, you, you have uh, oscillations and, and things like that. So we're working on trying to, to improve that, but I won't get into that too much. You can also pin the boundaries and squeeze it. There's recent experiments that's done this. Now it'll buckle, but there's two buckled states up and down. So now you have this two-state system. And so you can start looking at, at uh, so here's small temperatures. You get these, these bounces. Um, if you put uh, really high temperatures, it more or less goes flat just with a bunch of fluctuations. And you can start looking at phase transitions from the so-called buckled to the flat states. So there's a lot of interesting physics. One of the quite interesting parts is since if the sheet is bigger, then it needs to buckle less for the same strain. And so the transition from, from flat to buckled very strongly on the size of your system. So this is, this is kind of a unique feature of these things. And you can calculate exactly what this is um, in terms of the, the bulk modulus of the, the system and the, the bending energy coefficient. Anyway, um, so I, I wanted to get to this last topic, so sorry if I kind of dashed through that. Um, the next thing we wanted to do is look at a uh, couple cheats. So experimentally, people have been looking at a lot of different uh, sets of coupled cheats because they have very interesting electronic uh, properties. And so uh, we wanted to see if we could study them. So the idea is we're, we're going to simply add coupling between the two sheets. So we're gonna couple the densities, we're also gonna couple the heights. So they wanna be a certain height distance apart, and that depends on the stacking. And so in our simplest case, this is the simplest, say graphene, graphene. This is the density of one sheet. This is the density of the other sheet. And these H's are the heights of H1 and H2. And so then we wanted to fit these parameters uh, to density functional calculations. So there's this nice paper written some time ago in which they use four different density functional calculations to calculate the energy of different states, different stackings, whether they're the lowest energy state. And this is what they look like. One slightly disturbing feature is that they vary quite a bit. There's quite a bit of difference between the different approaches. Um, the, the, in the paper, what they said is, well, this, this particular DFT calculation seemed to give the uh, mechanical properties that were closest to what was there experimentally. So that's, that's the best. So then we try and fit our curves to this, this calculation. And so this, with, those, with that free energy introduced before, you can see we can do pretty well. And we, you could fit to any of these, but this was the best. So not quite, a little low there, a little high there. This one seems to work out well. This is the stacking energy and these are the stacking heights. And you know, if you wanna do better, you just add more parameters. So if, if I add on, uh, another term uh, in, in the, the height difference between the two, then you can get it essentially exactly. So uh, it depends on how careful you want to be about this. Considering the large deviation between the different DFT cases, I'm not sure it's you know, that necessary, but... Okay, so one thing we can start looking at now is things like um, domain wall energies. And so this is, uh, this is the case where we have um, so AB is the lowest energy state. This is also AB. So the red is the top and the, the black are the bottom atoms. These are, have exactly the same energy, but one of them is shifted. So if I start one in this stacking, this side of the system in the other stacking, then you get a domain wall between them. We got interested in this because there was um, some experiments that, that looked at this and found that they had the domain wall widths were different for the two cases. And they had one was was 10 and the other was six. This depends on whether you're in a zigzag or armchair or orientation. And so ours are not quite as big, but we can, and we can also predict what the energy of these things are, which, which are, are quite small. So that was one calculation that we did. You can also start to look at two sheets on top of each other and you twist them and you get, uh, well, this, this group called them breathing modes. You can also, this one, not that recent since last summer, kind of a funny result. Uh, a colleague of mine, Christian Akeem in, in Helsinki, wrote some CUDA code to, to use GPUs. It's about 20 times faster than, than my uh, uh, MPI code, so it's really nice. But he, he, he gave a, 
uh, uh, initial condition that was rotated states. And for fun, I don't know why, I chose close to the 30 degree difference between them, and oh, poof, you get a quasi-crystal. I was quite surprised. Six-fold symmetry, you don't expect it, but if you think about it, you take what were rotated one, you, you lie them on top, and now you've got 12-fold symmetry. So I think this is why this appear, um, appears in this system. And it turns out you start looking in literature and they see this. So this is what's seen experimentally. Anyway, a little bit of a fun aside. Um, you can also start looking at the influence of, of boundaries in one layer on the other layer and, and so forth. Um, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is the graphene HBN system. So again, this is the stacking energy. This is the stacking heights. These are the DFT calculations I mentioned before, and these are our fits. So they're not perfect. We could perhaps do a little better, but I think they have the main features that uh, this particular state, which in graphene is equivalent to this, but because uh, the HBN has this uh, sublattice ordering, they have different energies. Um, so this doesn't appear in graphene, but it catches these features, um, I think quite well. And you can start looking again at these inversion boundaries and, and calculations like that. Um, I won't get into that too much, but we can make predictions for what these inversion boundaries are in these bilayer systems and so forth. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is what happens uh, when you rotate them. And when you rotate them, if you just take these two systems and you rotate them and you overlay it, you essentially would have 30% in this state, 30% in this state, and 30% in this state. But this is the lowest energy state, so essentially it pushes aside those other states and you end up with patterns that look like this. So this yellow region corresponds to the lowest energy state. So this is the so-called AB state. This junction corresponds to this, this AB state, this particular state, so it has that or, this ordering. And this AA state is these junctions. And so you can tell this is height difference, but if I plotted the energy, what you would find is that three of these junctions are AA with a higher energy than the other three junctions, which are the um, AB prime. So these are the kind of patterns that start to emerge in these systems. Uh, when you rotate them with respect to each other. And you can try and estimate what the energy. So in this particular state, you can simply say, well, the energy is the energy of a junction times the number you have, the energy of these domain walls multiplied by their length, and then the energy of the, of the uh, bulk regions in the system. And so this should scale, scale like length squared, the scales like length, and then this is a constant. And so then you can go ahead and fit your data and when you uh, fit the data, you get predictions for these coefficients. So you get predictions for the uh, junction energy, which turns out to be negative in this case. And uh, you also get a domain wall energy. And these are the fits to this functional form. So they work reasonably well, at least for small angles. I'll just put in a small caveat. We assume that these domain walls, their energy and the junctions are independent of the system size, but it's not really true. When you look at a little bit more closely, if you look at the energy when you go across the domain wall, uh, it actually start, it changes as a function of angle. So that little simple approximation we made, there are multiple caveats. If you look at the occupancy, for the small angles, basically, eventually this is gonna, the AB state will dominate uh, since the area of these things goes like L squared and the other ones goes like, uh, goes like the number of junctions. Um, as, as you start to, to um, uh, put larger and larger angles, the patterns become smaller and smaller and smaller, and then they start to become the size of the domain walls. And so you kind of get a transition from these nice, well-defined structures to kind of a smeared out structure. And so here's an example of um, calculating the volumetric stress. Um, be careful not to touch my laptop. Okay, I got a few minutes left, good. Um, and so what we find is that, um, the volumetric stress and the, the so-called von Mises stress uh, have exactly the same pattern, except this one is minimum inside a domain, and that's because it really kind of is a measure of shear. And so you really just have uh, bulk compression inside here. It's really when you're going across a, a domain wall, you're going from one equilibrium sublattice to another. So there's typically a shear involved when you go through these domain walls. So same pattern, but, uh, but different, different signs essentially. And you can see, so this is nice and well-defined, but as you increase the angle from, so this is quite small to quite large, it just tends to smear them out. And if you look at them, so this is the, the uh, I think this is the average um, or total, I can't, I think it was the average of these, the volumetric and, and the von Mies, you see that you get uh, a transition from um, these kind of well-defined ones to these smeared out ones. They don't quite agree, but, and it's really not a thermodynamic transition. I think it's just a crossover behavior. Um, so that's what we expect to see. 
I'll just point out one other thing that surprised me when I first did these simulations. So if you take out, if you take a honeycomb lattice, sorry, my graphics aren't very good here, and you take another honeycomb lattice and you rotate them, you find the commensurate regions form, the lowest energy states, forms a hexagonal structure. So these are the higher energy states. If you do this with triangle, you get the same thing. If you do put a triangular lattice on a triangular lattice, um, you get exactly the same structure of these moray patterns, essentially. But if you take a triangular uh, structure and you rotate it on a honeycomb, this one's even harder to see, but the equilibrium, the lowest energy state, actually form a triangle. And so oh, I simulated graphene honeycomb on HBN, also honeycomb. You expect to get this pattern, but that's not the patterns that I show. In fact, this is what we get for the uh, graphene HBN case. And of course, the reason why, this is graphene, by the way, the reason why one of these states for graphene or HBN would be the AB prime, and so it just eliminates it. So if you take this one with six and uh, you eliminate three, you get this triangular pattern. Also, we had to try it. We do the same thing for graphene and HBN at almost 30 degrees. And, and again, you get this quasi-crystalline pattern. I was rather disappointed, though, that it didn't look significantly different than the graphene-graphene. Um, so I think, uh, I, think I, can, I can wrap it up there um, with a few minutes to spare. So I just wanted to talk about some of the work that we've done recently. We've started to look at these two-dimensional systems where we incorporate um, uh, elastic deformation uh, in, the, in the regular models, but this, in, including the outer plane deformation, I think is important in a, in a lot of applications. Particularly, most of the things that I'm interested in are dislocations and grain boundaries, and so all those things create these long-range elastic fields uh, that are that are highly impacted by by the buckling of the sheet. Um, and then, of course, we can use these things once we have models. We can start to study all sorts of different uh, boundaries, inversion boundaries, and these. Uh, uh, structural boundaries, and start to study more complicated systems, uh, moray patterns, uh, and so forth. And so we'd like to take kind of this uh, um, methodology and start applying it to um, other systems. So people have been interested in these metal dicalginides, MOS2. Uh, there, there's a whole slew of these things. Um, and what we really want to do is ask the question, if you deform one of the sheets, what happens to the other sheets? Because experimentally, of course, they want perfect sheets, but it rarely happens. And so we want to look at how the impact of a defect in one of the sheets will, will influence the other ones. So that what we've been doing lately is looking at a simple dislocation graphene, like I talked about earlier, and then put layers on top of it. And so what happens to the energy of that system? And what happens is it typically goes up because it's like you're increasing the rigidity of the system. So it's like you're bending the modulus starts to increase. And it seems by seven or eight sheets, it's almost looking like a rigid layer, but we haven't quite finished those studies, but I thought that was somewhat of an interesting result. But uh, okay, so let me, let me finish there. And if there's any questions, of course, I'd be happy to entertain them. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Ken, very much for talking about this topic. Thank you. Do we have the time for a question or two? I don't know. People on Zoom. I think there are some comments. Uh, so, excuse, excuse me. I. Yes. So you're. You're looking the underlying lattice. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is pair pair from home. Hey, pair. So, <clears throat> you and me. And you hear why I'm home. So um, the underlying lattices, you keep them constant. I mean, uh, you're changing uh, coordination numbers or. Well, so we.